Chapter 2 Martyr King Harold and the Norman Conquest, 1066-1070, The Wages of Sin The rule of St. Edward brought peace and prosperity, but a drastic decline in the moral condition of the people. Like Tsar Nicholas II, he presided over an unprecedented expansion of the Church's influence, which spread from England to Scandinavia, and in 1066 there were probably over 10,000 churches and chapels for a population of 1.5 million, with 400 churches in Kent alone. But again, like Tsar Martyr Nicholas, his departure betrayed by his subjects ushered in the fall of the nation and the triumph of the Antichrist. Thus, Edmer of Canterbury wrote of the monks of Christ Church Canterbury, just before the conquest, that they lived in all the glory of the world, with gold and silver and various elegant clothes, and beds with precious hangings. They had all sorts of musical instruments, which they liked playing, and horses, dogs and hawks, with which they were wont to walk. They lived indeed more like earls than monks. Again, several years before the arrival of the Normans, wrote the Anglo-Norman historian William of Malmesbury, love of literature and religion had decayed. The clergy, content with little learning, could scarcely stammer out the words of the sacraments. A person who understood grammar was an object of wonder and astonishment. The monks mocked the rule by their fine clothes and wide variety of foods. The nobility, devoted to luxury and lechery, did not go to church in the morning like Christians, but merely, a casual manner, attended matins and the liturgy, hurried through by some priest, in their own chambers amidst the caresses of their wives. The common people, left unprotected, were prey to the powerful, who amassed fortunes by seizing their property or selling them to foreigners, although by nature this people is more inclined to self-accumulation of wealth. Drinking bouts were a universal practice, occupying entire nights as well as days. The vices attendant on drunkenness, which enervate the human mind, resulted. William mentions that there were some good clergy and laymen. Nevertheless, even allowing for some exaggeration, the general picture of decline is clear. If the curse of God on a sinful people was the ultimate cause of the tragedy, the proximate causes are to be sought in the lust for power of England's external enemies, and in particular Duke William and the Pope of Rome. Duke William claimed that the Kingdom of England had been bequeathed to him by King Edward. As we have seen, it was to Earl Harold, not William, that the king bequeathed the kingdom on his deathbed, and this election was confirmed by the Witan immediately after King Edward's death. However, William pointed to three facts in defence of his claim and in rejection of Harold's. First, there was the murder of Prince Alfred in 1036, which almost everybody ascribed to Earl Godwin, the father of Harold. However, Harold could not be blamed for the sin of his father, although that is precisely what William of Poitiers did. And there is ample evidence that King Edward had trusted Harold in a way that he had never trusted his father. Secondly, there was the uncanonical position of Archbishop Steigand, who had been banned by the Pope, and who, according to the Norman sources, but not according to the English, had crowned and anointed Harold as king. William made out that the English church, as well as being led by an uncanonical archbishop, was in Caesaropapist submission to a usurper king. The irony is that William's own archbishop, Morilius, had been uncanonically appointed by the duke, who exerted a more purely Caesaropapist control over his church than any European ruler before him. But the Pope was prepared to overlook this indiscretion, and the other indiscretion of his uncanonical marriage, in exchange for his military support against the Byzantine Empire and England. Thus, from 1059, the Normans were given the Pope's blessing to conquer the Greek-speaking possessions of the Empire in southern Italy in the name of St. Peter. And when that conquest was completed, they went on to invade Greece in the 1080s, and then, during the First Crusade, the Near East, where they established the Norman Kingdom of Antioch. For the Normans, 
were the Bolsheviks of 11th century Europe, the military right arm of the totalitarian revolution that began in Rome in 1054. Thirdly, and most seriously in the eyes of 11th century Europeans, Harold had broken the oath of fealty that he had taken to William in 1064. Now all the evidence suggests that this oath was taken under duress. Nevertheless, and even if Harold had received absolution for breaking his oath, there can be no doubt that this sin weakened his position probably more than any other factor. The Embassy to Rome When Harold was crowned king, William sent a formal protest to him, which was rejected. William now set about preparing to invade England and depose Harold. Having won the support of his nobles and clergy for his plans, he turned to the much-admired Abbot Lanfranc of Beck for advice as to whether the Pope would support him. One of his arguments would undoubtedly have been Harold's perjury and therefore his unsuitability to be king from the Church's point of view. Patterson writes, William perhaps would add to his list of allegations. Harold was a man of flagrantly corrupt morals, a fornicator who had brought children into the world without the benefit of a church-sanctioned marriage. He lived openly with a woman, Edith Swan Neck, who was not his wife. He lived in disdain for and in rebellion against the church's requirements for a Christian family. Surely the Pope did not wish to have such a man as King of England. Furthermore, William may have claimed, Stigand, the Archbishop, or so-called Archbishop, who supposedly heard King Edward designate Harold as his successor, was no more than Harold's family retainer. He was a fraudulent Archbishop, illegally appointed, while Robert of Jumiege, who was lawfully appointed, still held the office, but was forced out of England by Harold and his father. Stigan was appointed solely at the demand of Harold's family, William might have claimed, in order to have him serve Harold's family's ends. The Duke might have asked whether Stigand was an example of the church appointments Harold could be expected to make. Could the Pope be willing to place into the hands of a morally corrupt self-server the future of the church in England? Lanfranc, familiar with the church's affairs, might have offered some ammunition of his own. Harold and his brothers had persisted in supporting Stigand, even though he was under a cloud of suspicion. Harold and his brothers had consistently resisted the reforms that Rome had asked the church in England to make. The result of this meeting was that, as Douglas writes, at some undetermined date within the first eight months of 1066, William appealed to the papacy, and a mission was sent under the leadership of Gilbert, Archdeacon of Lisieux, to ask for judgment in the Duke's favour from Alexander II. No records of the case as it was heard in Rome have survived, nor is there any evidence that Harold Godwinson was ever summoned to appear in his own defence. On the other hand, the arguments used by the Duke's representatives may be confidently surmised. Foremost among them must have been an insistence on Harold's oath and its violation when the Earl seized the throne. Something may also have been alleged against the House of Godwin by reference to the murder of the Atheling Alfred in 1036 and to the counter-revolution of 1052. The Duke could, moreover, point to the recent and notable ecclesiastical revival in the province of Rouen and claim that he had done much to foster it. For these reasons, the reforming papacy might legitimately look for some advantage in any victory which William might obtain over Harold. Thus was the Duke of Normandy enabled to appear as the armed agent of ecclesiastical reform against a prince who through his association with Stigand had identified himself with conditions which were being denounced by the reforming party in the church. Archdeacon Hildebrand, therefore, came vigorously to the support of Duke William, and Alexander II was led publicly to proclaim his approval of Duke William's enterprise. According to Frank McLean, it was the argument concerning Stegan's uncanonicity that most interested Alexander. William pitched his appeal to the papacy largely on his putative role as the leader of the religious and ecclesiastical reform movement in Normandy and as a man who could clean the Augean stables of church corruption in England.
This weighed heavily with Alexander, who, as his joust with Harold Hardrada in 1061 demonstrated, thought the churches of Northern Europe far too remote from papal control. It was the abiding dream of the new reformist papacy to be universally accepted as the arbiter of thrones and their succession. William's homage therefore constituted a valuable precedent. Not surprisingly, Alexander gave the proposed invasion of England his blessing. It has sometimes been queried why Harold did not send his own embassy to counter William's arguments. Almost certainly, the answer is that he thought it a waste of time on two grounds. The method of electing a king in England had nothing to do with the Pope and was not a proper area for his intervention, and, in any case, the Pope was now the creature of the Normans in southern Italy and would ultimately do what they ordered him to do. Harold was right. Alexander II blessed all the Norman marauding expeditions of the 1060s. But, although papal sanction for William's enterprise of England was morally worthless, it was both a great propaganda and diplomatic triumph for the Normans. It was a propaganda victory because it allowed William to pose as the leader of crusaders in a holy war, obfuscating and mystifying the base, materialistic motives of his followers and mercenaries. It also gave the Normans a great psychological boost, for they could perceive themselves as God's elect, and it is significant that none of William's inner circle entertained doubts about the ultimate success of the English venture. Normandy now seemed the spearhead of a confident Christianity on the offensive for the first time in centuries, whereas earlier, Western Christendom had been beleaguered by Vikings to the north, Hungarians to the east, and Islam to the south. It was no accident that with Hungary and Scandinavia recently Christianized, the Normans were the vanguard in the First Crusade, properly so called, against the Islamic heathens in the Holy Land. Alexander's fiat was a diplomatic triumph too, as papal endorsement for the Normans made it difficult for other powers to intervene on Harold's side. William also preempted one of the potential sources of support for the Anglo Saxons by sending an embassy to the German Emperor Henry IV. This too was notably successful, removing a possible barrier to a Europe wide call for volunteers in the Crusade. What would have happened if William had lost the case in Rome? John Hudson speculates that the reformers in the papacy, who had backed William in his quest for the English throne, might have lost their momentum. Normandy would have been greatly weakened. In other words, the whole course of European history might have been changed. Gilbert returned to Rouen, writes Patterson, bearing not only the great good news of William's victory in Rome, but the papal banner, white with a red cross, which the Pope had given him to present to Duke William, allowing the Duke to go to war beneath the symbol of the Church's authorization. Gilbert also carried to the Duke another gift from the Pope, a heavy gold ring blessed by the Holy Father and containing, in a tiny compartment covered by the hinged, engraved top of the ring, one of the most sacred relics the Pope could give, an enormously powerful token of divine favour to be borne by the Duke into battle, a hair believed to be from the holy head of St. Peter himself. So at the beginning of 1066, Duke William began to gather a vast army from all round Western Europe in preparation for what became, in effect, the first crusade of the heretical papacy against the Orthodox Church. The dramatic story of that fateful year was to decide the destiny of the Western Christian peoples for centuries to come. For if the English had defeated the Normans, it is likely that not only the Norman conquests in the rest of Europe would never have taken place, but also the power of the reformed papacy would have gone into sharp decline, enabling the forces of true Romanity to recover. But divine providence judged otherwise. For their sins, the Western peoples were counted unworthy of the pearl beyond price, holy orthodoxy, which they had bought with such self-sacrificial enthusiasm so many centuries before. Harold the King. The new king is described by the anonymous biographer as handsome, graceful and strong in body, and although he is implicitly critical of Harold's behaviour in 1065 
during the Northumbrian rebellion, probably reflecting the views of Queen Edith, he nevertheless calls him wise, patient, merciful, courageous, temperate, and prudent in character. That he was both strong and courageous is witnessed not only by his highly successful military career, but also by his pulling two men out of the quicksand during his stay with William in 1064. The fact that he was admired and trusted by most Englishmen is shown by his ascending the throne without any opposition, although he was not the strongest candidate by hereditary right. Only after his death did anyone put forward the candidacy of Prince Edgar, and that only half-heartedly. Thus on the English side, there was general agreement that, in spite of his oath, he was the best man to lead the country. He was both hated and admired by the Normans. Thus William of Poitiers admitted that he was warlike and courageous. And Ordericus Vitalis, writing some seventy years after the conquest, says that Harold was much admired for his great stature and elegance, for his bodily strength, for his quick wittedness and verbal facility, his sense of humour, and his honest bearing. Whatever his personal sins before he became king, he appears to have tried hard to atone for them once he ascended the throne. Perhaps under the influence of Bishop Wollstan, he put away his mistress, the beautiful Edith Swanneck, and entered into lawful marriage with the sister of Earls Edwin and Morker, Alditha. Then, as Florence of Worcester writes, he immediately began to abolish unjust laws and to make good ones, to patronise churches and monasteries, to pay particular reverence to bishops, abbots, monks and clerics, and to show himself pious, humble and affable to all good men. But he treated malefactors with great severity and gave general orders to his earls, ealdormen, sheriffs and thens to imprison all thieves, robbers and disturbances of the kingdom. He laboured in his own person by sea and by land for the protection of his realm. Although there had been no open opposition to his consecration as king, one source indicates that the Northumbrians, a great and turbulent folk, were not ready to submit, just as they had not been ready to submit to King Edward. Harold needed to be sure that he had the support of the turbulent North. So early in the year, he enlisted the aid of Bishop Wolfstan on a peacemaking mission to Northumbria. For the fame of Wolfstan's holiness, writes William of Malmesbury, had so found a way to the remotest tribes that it was believed that he could quell the most stubborn insolence. And so it came to pass. For those tribes, untamable by the sword and haughty from generation to generation, yet for the reverence they bore to the bishop, easily yielded allegiance to Harold. And they would have continued in that way had not Tostig, as I have said, turned them aside from it. Wolfstan, good, gentle and kindly though he was, spake not smooth things to the sinners, but rebuked their vices and threatened them with evil to come. If they were still rebellious, he warned them plainly, they should pay the penalty in suffering. Never did his human wisdom or his gift of prophecy deceive him. Many things to come, both, on that journey and at other times, did he foretell. Moreover he spake, plainly to Harold of the Calamities, which should befall him, and all England if he should not bethink himself to correct their wicked ways. For in those days the English were for the most part evil livers, and in peace and the abundance of pleasant things luxury flourished. In the spring and summer, as Halley's comet blazed across the sky, the two armies massed on opposite sides of the channel. While William built a vast fleet to take his men across the channel, King Harold kept his men under arms and at a high degree of alert all along the southern English coast. By September, William was ready, but adverse winds kept him in French ports. King Harold, however, was forced to let his men go home to bring in the harvest. The English coast was now dangerously exposed, and on September 27th, taking advantage of a change in the wind, William embarked his men. The Battle of Stamford Bridge. As if that were not enough, 
Harold now suffered another reverse. King Harald Hardrada of Norway, who had acquired a great reputation as a warrior in the Byzantine emperor's army, invaded Northumbria with the aid of the English king. Harold's exiled brother Tostig, according to the medieval Icelandic historian Snorri Sturluson, as the Norwegian Harald was preparing to invade England, he dreamed that he was in Trondheim and met there his half-brother, St. Olaf. And Olaf told him that he had won many victories and died in holiness because he had stayed in Norway. But now he feared that he, Harald, would meet his death, and wolves will rend your body. God is not to blame. Snorri wrote that many other dreams and portents were reported at the time, and most of them were ominous. After defeating Earls Edwin and Morcar at Gate Fulford on September 20th, the Norwegian king triumphantly entered York, whose citizens, mainly of Scandinavian extraction, not only surrendered to him, but agreed to march south with him against the rest of England. This last betrayal, which took place in the same city in which, 760 years before, the founder of Christian Rome, St. Constantine the Great, had been proclaimed emperor by the Roman legions, was probably decisive in sealing the fate of Orthodox England. But on September 25th, after an amazingly rapid forced march from London, the English King Harold went through York and seven miles on to Stamford Bridge, where the Norwegians and rebel English and Flemish mercenaries were encamped. After a long battle in which both sides suffered huge losses, the Norwegian army was destroyed and both Harald Hardrada and Tostig were killed. The C manuscript of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle ends on this high point, but divine providence decreed that the end was not yet. On October 1st, while he was celebrating his victory in York, King Harold heard that William had landed at Pevensey on the south coast. Although from a military point of view, he would probably have done better to rest and gather together a large force from all round the country, while drawing William further away from his base, thereby stretching his lines of communication, Harold decided to employ the same tactics of forced marches and a lightning strike that had worked so well against the Norwegians so he marched his men back down to London. On the way, he stopped at Waltham, a monastery he had founded and generously endowed to house the greatest holy object of the English church, the Black Cross of Waltham. Several years before, this cross had been discovered in the earth in response to a divine revelation to a humble priest of Montacute in Somerset. It was placed on a cart drawn by oxen, but the oxen refused to move until the name Waltham was pronounced. Then the oxen moved, without any direction from men, straight towards Waltham, which was many miles away on the other side of the country. On the way, 66 miracles of healing were accomplished on sick people who venerated it, until it came to rest at the spot where King Harold built his monastery. Only a few days before, on his way to York, King Harold had stopped at the monastery and was praying in front of the Black Cross when he received a cheering message from Abbot Ethelwine of Ramsey. King Edward the Confessor had appeared to him that night, he said, and told him of his, Harold's, affliction of both body and spirit, his anxiety for the safety of his kingdom and the violent pain which had suddenly seized his leg. Then he said that through his intercession, God had granted Harold the victory and healing from his pain. Cheered by this message, Harold received the healing of his pain and the victory. But it was a different story on the way back south to fight the Normans. Harold went into the Church of the Holy Cross and placed the relics which he had in his capella on the altar and made a vow that if the Lord granted him success in the war, he would confer on the church a mass of treasures and a great number of clerics to serve God there, and that he himself would serve God as his bought slave. The clergy, therefore, who accompanied him, together with a procession which went before, came to the doors of the church where he was lying prostrate, his arms outstretched in the form of a cross in front of the Holy Cross, 
praying to the crucified one. An extraordinary miracle then took place, for the image of the crucifixion, which before had been erect looking upward, when it saw the king humble himself to the ground, lowered its face as if sad. The wood indeed knew the future. The sacristan Turquil claimed that he himself had seen this and intimated it to many while he was collecting and storing away the gifts which the king had placed on the altar. I received this from his mouth and from the assertion of many bystanders who saw the head of the image erect. But no one except Turkel saw its bending down. When they saw this bad omen, overcome with great sorrow, they sent the senior and most distinguished brothers of the church, Osegud Knop and Elric Childermeister, in the company to the battle, so that when the outcome was known, they might take care of the bodies of the king and those of his men who were devoted to the church, and if the future would have it so, bring back their corpses. The Battle of Hastings On October 5th, Harold was back in London with his exhausted army. Common sense dictated that he stay there until the levies he had summoned arrived, but instead, to the puzzlement of commentators from the 11th to the 20th centuries, he pushed on by a forced march of 50 to 60 miles south after only a few days' rest and without the much-needed reinforcements. What was the reason for this crucial tactical blunder? David Howarth has argued convincingly that the reason was that Harold now, for the first time, heard from an envoy of Williams that he and his followers had been excommunicated by the Pope and that William was fighting with the Pope's blessing and under a papal banner, with a tooth of St. Peter encrusted in gold around his neck. This meant that he was not merely defying William, he was defying the Pope. It was doubtful whether the church, the army, and the people would support him in that defiance. At best, they would be bewildered and half-hearted. Therefore, since a battle had to be fought, it must be fought at once, without a day's delay, before the news leaked out. After that, if the battle was won, would be time to debate the Pope's decision, explain that the trial had been a travesty, query it, appeal against it, or simply continue to defy it. This had become a private matter of conscience. There was one higher appeal, to the judgment of God himself, and Harold could only surrender himself to that judgment. May the Lord now decide between Harold and me, William had said. He had been challenged to meet for the final decision, and he could not evade it. In order that God might declare his judgment, he was obliged to accept the challenge in person. He left London in the evening of 12th October, a few friends with him who knew what had happened and still believed in him, Gerth and his brother Leofwine, his nephew Hakon, whom he had rescued from Normandy, two canons from Waltham, already nervous at the miracle they had seen, two aged and respected abbots who carried chainmail above their habits, and, perhaps at a distance, Edith Svanischels, the mother of his sons. He led the army, who did not know, the remains of his house carls and whatever men of the fired had already gathered in London. The northern earls had been expected with contingents, but they had not come and he could not wait. He rode across London Bridge again, and this time down the Dover Road to Rochester, and then by the minor Roman road that plunged south through the Andridas Wald, the forest now yellow with autumn, and the road already covered with fallen leaves. The men of Kent and Sussex were summoned to meet at an ancient apple tree that stood at the junction of the tracks outside the enclave of Hastings. Harold reached that meeting place late on Friday 13th, ready to face his judgment and even while the army was forming for battle, if one may further believe the Roman de Roo, the terrible rumour was starting to spread that the king was excommunicated and the same fate hung over any man who fought for him. The only military advantage Harold might have gained from his tactics, that of surprise, was lost. William had been informed of his movements, and so, as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says, it was William who, 
early on the morning of October 14th, came upon him unexpectedly before his army was set in order. Nevertheless, the king fought against him most resolutely with those men who wished to stand by him, and there was great slaughter on both sides. King Harold was slain, and Leofwine, his brother, and Earl Gerth, his brother, and many good men. The French had possession of the place of slaughter, as God granted them because of the nation's sins. Why did the chronicler say, with those men who wished to stand by him? Because many did not wish to stay with him when they learned of the Pope's anathema, and yet many others stayed, including several churchmen. Why did they stay, knowing that they stood to lose, not only their bodies, but also, if the anathema was true, their eternal souls? Very few probably knew about the schism of 1054 between Rome and Constantinople, or about the theological arguments over the filioque, over unleavened bread at the liturgy, over the supposed universal jurisdiction of the Pope. That led to the schism of 1054. Still fewer, if any, could have come to the firm conclusion that Rome was wrong and Constantinople was right, that Harold had perjured himself in coming to the throne was generally accepted, and yet they stayed with him. In following King Harold, the Englishmen who fought and died at Hastings were following their hearts rather than their heads. Their hearts told them that, whatever the sins of the king and the nation, he was still their king and this was still their nation. Surely God would not want them to desert these at the time of their greatest need, in a life and death struggle against a merciless foreign invader. Perhaps they remembered the words of Archbishop Wolfstan of York. By what means shall peace and comfort come to God's servants and God's poor, but through Christ and through a Christian king? Almost certainly they were drawn by a grace-filled feeling of loyalty to the Lord's anointed, for the English were exceptional in their continuing veneration for the monarchy, which in other parts had been destroyed by the papacy. The English might also have reflected that this day, October 14th, was the feast of St. Callistus, a third-century pope who was considered by many Roman Christians of his time, including St. Hippolytus, to be a schismatic anti-pope. If that pope could have been a schismatic, was there not much more reason to believe that this one was schismatic too, being under the anathema of the great church of Constantinople and presuming as he did to dispose of kingdoms as he did churches and blessing the armed invasion of peaceful Christian countries by uninvited foreigners? And if so, then was it not they, the Normans, who were the schismatics, while the true Christians were those who refused to obey their false decrees and anathemas. In any case, after the battle very few Englishmen fled to old Rome, the traditional refuge of English exiles. They preferred, as we have seen, the orthodox capitals of Constantinople and Russia, the burial of King Harold. After Hastings, William could claim that God had decided between him and Harold in his favour, and yet, even his Norman bishops were not so sure. Thus, in a conciliar enactment of 1070, they imposed penances on all of William's men who had taken part in the battle, in spite of the fact that they had fought with the Pope's blessing. William's actions just after the battle were unprecedentedly cruel and impious, even by the not very civilised standards of the time. Thus, he refused to give the body of King Harold which had been hideously mutilated by the Normans, to his mother for burial, although she offered him the weight of the body in gold. Eventually, the monks of Waltham, with the help of Harold's former mistress, Edith Swanneck, found the body and buried it, as was thought in Waltham. However, there is now compelling evidence that a mutilated body discovered in a splendid coffin in Godwin's family church at Bosham on April 7, 1954, is in fact the body of the last Orthodox King of England. In fact, two royal coffins were found on that date. One was found to contain the bones of the daughter of a previous King of England, Canute, who had drowned at a young age. The other, magnificently furnished coffin, contained the bones of a middle-aged man, but with no head, 
and with several of the bones fractured. It was supposed that these were the bones of Earl Godwin, the father of King Harold. For several years, no further attention was paid to this discovery. However, just recently a local historian, John Pollock, has re-examined all the evidence relating to the bones in the second coffin and has come to the conclusion that they belong to none other than King Harold himself. He points out, first, that they could not belong to Earl Godwin because, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Godwin was buried in Winchester, not Bosham. Secondly, the bones are in a severely mutilated state, which does not accord with what we know about Godwin's death. However, this does accord with what we know about King Harold's death, for he was savagely hacked to pieces by four knights on the field of battle. As the earliest account of the battle that we have, by Guy, Bishop of Amiens, says, With the point of his lance the first, William pierced Harold's shield and then penetrated his chest, drenching the ground with his blood, which poured out in torrents. With his sword, the second, Eustace, cut off his head, just below where his helmet protected him. The third, Hugh, disemboweled him with his javelin. The fourth, Walter Giffard, hacked off his leg at the thigh and hurled it far away. Struck down in this way, the dead body lay on the ground. Moreover, the Bayou tapestry clearly shows the sword of one of the knights cutting into the king's left thigh and one of the bones in the coffin is precisely a fractured left thigh bone. Thirdly, although some sources say that Harold was buried in the monastery he founded at Waltham, his body has never been found there or anywhere else in spite of extensive searches. However, the most authoritative of the sources, William of Poitiers, addresses the dead Harold thus, Now you lie there in your grave by the sea by generations yet unborn of English and Normans, you will ever be accursed. The church at Bosham is both by the sea and not far from the field of battle. Therefore it is possible that the grieving monks who are said to have buried King Harold's body at Waltham, in fact buried it in his own family church by the sea at Bosham. Or, more likely, William himself buried it at Bosham since the church passed into his possession and he is said to have ordered its burial on the seashore. But this was done in secret because the Normans did not want any public veneration of the king they hated so much and the church could not tolerate pilgrimages to the grave of this, the last powerful enemy of the reformed papacy in the West. And so the rumour spread that Harold had survived the battle and had become a secret hermit in the north a rumour that we can only now reject with certainty. William the King After Hastings, William made slow, S-shaped progress through Kent, Surrey, Hampshire and across the Thames at Wallingford to Berkhamsted, north of London. As he was approaching London, near St Albans, the shrine of the proto-martyr of Britain, he found the road blocked, according to Matthew of Paris, by masses of great trees that had been felled and drawn across the road. The abbot of St Albans was sent for to explain these demonstrations, who, in answer to the king's questions, frankly and fearlessly said, I have done the duty appertaining to my birth, he was of royal blood, and calling, and if others of my rank and profession had performed the like, as they well could and ought, it had not been in thy power to penetrate into the land so far. Not long after, that same Frederick was at the head of a confederacy, determined, if possible, to compel William to reign like a Saxon prince, that is, according to the ancient laws and customs, or to place Edgar Atheling in his room. William submitted for a time, and in a great council at Berkhamsted, swore upon all the relics of the Church of St Albans that he would keep the laws in question, the oath being administered by Abbot Frederick. In the end, however, the conqueror grew strong to be coerced by any measures, however nationally excellent or desirable, and he does not seem to have cared much about oath-breaking unless it was he who had enacted the oath.
the unhappy Harold, for instance, found that no light matter, and so William became more oppressive than ever. St Albans, as might have been anticipated, suffered especially from his vengeance. He seized all its lands that lay between Barnet and Londonstone, and was with difficulty prevented from utterly ruining the monastery. As it was, the blow was enough for Frederick, who died of grief in the monastery of Ely, whither he had been compelled to flee. In November, the conqueror stayed in Canterbury, from which Archbishop Stigand had fled in order to join the national resistance in London. One night, St Dunstan was seen leaving the church by some of the brethren. When they tried to detain him, he said, I cannot remain here on account of the filth of your evil ways and crimes in the church. The first church of the kingdom did not long survive St Dunstan's departure. On December 6, 1067, it was burned to the ground. William continued his march, systematically devastating the land as he passed through it. Early in December, he was in Southwark, burnt it, and drove off Prince Edgar's troops at London Bridge. Important defections from the English side began to take place. The first was Edith, King Edward's widow and King Harold's sister, who gave him the key city of Winchester. Then Archbishop Stigand submitted to him at Wallingford. And at Berkhamsted, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, he was met by Bishop Aldred of York, Prince Edgar, Earl Edwin, Earl Morcar, and all the best men from London who submitted out of necessity. Finally, on Christmas Day, how fateful has that day been, both for good and ill in English history. He was crowned king by Archbishop Aldred, and William gave a pledge on the Gospels and swore an oath besides, before Aldred would place the crown on his head, that he would govern this nation according to the best practice of his predecessors, if they would be loyal to him. The Londoners also suffered from their new master. During William's coronation service, Archbishop Aldred first asked the English in English if it was their will that William be made king. They assented. Then Geoffrey, Bishop of Coutances, addressed the Normans in French with the same question. When they, too, assented, those who were standing guard outside the abbey became alarmed because of the shouting and started to set fire to the city. Professor Alan Brown writes, Orderic Vitalis, in a vivid passage, describes how panic spread within the church as men and women of all degrees pressed to the doors in flight, and only a few were left to complete the coronation of King William, who, he says, was violently trembling. For William this must indeed have been the one terrifying moment of his life. He believed implicitly in his right to England, and God had seemed to favour that right and to deliver his judgement on the field of Hastings. And now, at the supreme moment of anointing and sanctification at his coronation, when the grace of God should come upon him and make him king and priest, there came a great noise, and the windows of the abbey church lit up with fire and people fled all about him. It must have seemed to him then that in spite of all previous signs and portents, he was wrong, unworthy, that his God had turned against him and rejected both him and his cause, and it is no wonder that he trembled until the awful moment had passed and the world came right again. After the festivities, the conqueror imposed a very heavy tax on the people. Then, after giving instructions for the building of castles all over the land, he returned to Normandy, taking all the chief men of England with him as hostages. The Harrowing of the North In December 1067, he returned to England and quickly put down rebellions in Kent and Hertfordshire. Then a more serious rebellion broke out in Exeter. Thither he marched with a combined army of Normans and Englishmen and after a siege of eighteen days, the city surrendered, which was followed by the submission of the Celts of Cornwall and the cities of Gloucester and Bristol. Meanwhile, in the north resistance was gathering around Earl Morcar, who had been allowed to return from Normandy, and there was a threat of interventions by King Malcolm of Scotland, who was sheltering Prince Edgar, 
and had married his sister Margaret and King Sween of Denmark. After spending Pasha at Winchester, William marched swiftly north and built castles in Warwick and York, where he received the submission of the local magnates and secured a truce with the Scottish king. Then he turned southward to secure the submission of Lincoln, Huntingdon and Cambridge. But on January 28, 1069, the Norman whom William had appointed Earl of Northumbria north of the Tees was attacked in the streets of Durham and burnt to death in the house of Bishop Ethelwine. This was followed by an uprising in York, and Prince Edgar prepared to move from Scotland. William, however, moved more swiftly, dispersing the besiegers of York Castle, taking vengeance on the rebels and appointing Gospatric as Earl. In early summer, 1069, he returned to Normandy, but almost immediately a Danish fleet of about 240 ships sailed into the Humber. Combining with Edgar, Gospatric and Waltheof, they destroyed the Norman garrison at York and then encamped on the southern shore of the Humber, fortifying the Isle of Axholm. This was the signal for other uprisings in Dorset and under Edric the Wild in the Welsh borders. The great French historian Thierry writes of this northern campaign. The conquering army, whose divisions covered a space of a hundred miles, traversed this territory in all directions, and the traces of their passage through it were deeply imprinted. The old historians relate that, from the Humber to the Tyne, not a piece of cultivated land, not a single inhabited village remained. The monasteries which had escaped the ravages of the Danish pagans, that of St. Peter near Ware, and that of Whitby inhabited by women, were profaned and burned. To the south of the Humber, according to the early narrators, the ravage was no less dreadful. They say, in their passionate language, that between York and the Eastern Sea, every living creature was put to death, from man to beast, excepting only those who took refuge in the church of St. John the Archbishop of York, at Beverley. This John was a saint of the English race, and on the approach of the conquerors, a great number of men and women flocked, with all that they had most valuable, round the church dedicated to their blessed countrymen, in order that, remembering in heaven that he was a Saxon, he might protect them and their property from the fury of the foreigner. The Norman camp was then seven miles from Beverley. It was rumoured that the church of St. John was the refuge of the rich and depository of the riches of the country. Some adventurous scouts, who by the contemporary history are denominated knights, set out under the command of one Tustan in order to be the first to seize the prize. They entered Beverley without resistance, marched to the churchyard where the terrified crowd were assembled and passed its barriers, giving themselves not more concern about the Saxon saint than about the Saxons who invoked him. Tustan, the chief of the band, casting his eye over the groups of English, observed an old man richly clad, with gold bracelets in the fashion of his nation. He galloped towards him with his sword drawn, and the terrified old man fled to the church. Tustan pursued him, but he had scarcely passed the gates, when, his horse's feet slipping on the pavement, he was thrown off and stunned by the fall. At the sight of their captain half dead, the rest of the Normans turned round, and their imaginations being excited, hastened full of dread, to relate this terrible example of the power of John of Beverley. When the army passed through, no one dared again to tempt the vengeance of the blessed saint, and the territory of his church alone remained covered with habitations and produce in the midst of the devastated country. Famine, like a faithful companion of the conquest, followed their footsteps. From the year 1067, it had been desolating some provinces, which alone had then been conquered, but in 1069 it extended itself through the whole of England and appeared in all its horror in the newly conquered territories. The inhabitants of the province of York and the country to the north, after feeding on the horses which the Norman army abandoned on the roads, devoured human flesh. More than a hundred thousand people of all ages died of want in these countries. 
In the wake of the secular armies came the ecclesiastical. Thus new monasteries were founded by the conqueror and peopled with Norman monks. Or the monks of the old monasteries were simply slaughtered to make way for the new. For example, at Stone near Stafford on the Trant, as Thierry writes, there was a small oratory, where two nuns and a priest passed their days in praying in honour of a Saxon saint called Wolft. All three were killed by one Enisunt, a soldier of the conquering army, which Enisunt, says the legend, killed the priest and the two nuns, that his sister, whom he had brought with him, might have the church. Professor Douglas writes, An eleventh-century campaign was inevitably brutal, but the methods here displayed were widely regarded as exceptional and beyond excuse, even by those who were otherwise fervent admirers of the Norman king. I am more disposed to pity the sorrows and sufferings of the wretched people than to undertake the hopeless task of screening one who was guilty of such wholesale massacre by lying flatteries. I assert, moreover, that such barbarous homicide should not pass unpunished. Such was the view of a monk in Normandy. A writer from northern England supplies more precise details of the horrible incidents of the destruction and recalls the rotting and putrefying corpses which littered the highways of the afflicted province. Pestilence inevitably ensued, and an analyst of Evesham tells how refugees in the last state of destitution poured into the little town. Nor is it possible to dismiss these accounts as rhetorical exaggeration for twenty years later. Domesday book shows the persisting effects of the terrible visitation, and there is evidence that these endured until the reign of Stephen. Archbishop Aldred of York died, broken-hearted, on September 11, 1069, in the burnt-out shell of his metropolitan see. But not before he had gone to William and publicly cursed him for breaking his coronation oath. Bishop Wolfstan of Worcester meekly accepted the conqueror's rule, and he was now sent to pacify Chester, being the only bishop to whom the people of that northwestern province, the last to be conquered by the Normans, would be likely to listen. His surrender, more than any other, signified the end of the English resistance. For while bands of fugitives continued to struggle in different parts of the country, particularly in the fens under the famous Hereward the Wake, Wolfstan was the last Englishman of nationwide renown around whom a national resistance could have formed. Before leaving events in the North, we should not forget to mention the influence of the greatest saint of the North, St. Cuthbert, plus 6 and 87. After the violent death of William's appointee, Robert Comyn, in Durham, another expedition was sent by William to restore order. But St. Cuthbert's power, which had terrified unholy kings in the past, had not abandoned his people. For the expedition, writes C.J. Stranks, was turned back by a thick mist sent for the protection of his people by St. Cuthbert when the army reached North Allerton. Then the king himself came. The frightened monks, led by Bishop Ethelwine of Durham, decided to take refuge at Lindisfarne and, of course, to take the body of their saint with them. When they reached the shore opposite to the island, night had fallen and there was a storm raging. It looked as if their way was blocked, for the sea covered the causeway. They were tired and frightened, and at their wit's end, when miraculously, as it seemed to them, the sea withdrew, and the path to the island lay open. Their stay was not long, for they were back in Durham by the beginning of Lent 1070. Two years later, William the Conqueror himself felt the saint's power. He was staying in Durham for a little while, on his way home from Scotland, in order to begin building the castle there. Perhaps he had heard of the flight to Lindisfarne, for he thought it necessary to take an oath of the monks that St Cuthbert's body was really at Durham. But he was still not convinced, and ordered that the tomb should be opened on All Saints' Day, threatening that if the body was not there, he would execute all the officers of the monastery. The day arrived. Mass was begun when suddenly the king was seized by a violent fever. It was obvious that the saint was angry at his temerity. William left the church, mounted his horse and never looked back until he had crossed the Tees and was safely out of the patrimony of St Cuthbert. 
Meanwhile, Bishop Ethelwine decided to flee Norman England. He tried to set sail for Cologne, but adverse winds drove his ship to Scotland, where he spent the winter. In 1071, however, he headed for Ely, where the English were to make their last stand. The Last Stand of the English In 1071, the last remnants of the English resistance, led by Earls Edwin, Morcar and Syward, and Bishop Ethelwine of Durham, sought refuge in the island monastery of Ely in East Anglia. There, under the leadership of Hereward the Wake, they made frequent sallies against William's men. When William heard of this, he invested the island and started to build a causeway towards it. However, Hereward's men put up a strong resistance, and the most Christian King William then resorted to a most infamous tactic. He called in a witch, put her onto a tower over the fens, and ordered her to cast spells on the English. But this too failed to work. The English launched a successful counter-attack, and the witch fell from her tower and broke her neck. Finally, it was through the abbot and monks, with the connivance of early Morcar, that William conquered the stronghold. For considering it their sacred duty, as the Book of Ely put it, to maintain their magnificent temple of God and St. Ethildreda, they came to terms with William, and in exchange for promises that their lands would be restored and confirmed, they guided the Normans secretly into the rebel stronghold. Hereward and his men made their escape, but others were not so fortunate. As Kitely writes, many must have wondered whether surrender had been such a good idea after all. The king caused all the defenders to be brought before him, first the leaders and then anyone else of rank or fame. Some he sent to perpetual imprisonment, among them the deluded Morcar, Seward and Bishop Ethelwine. Others he condemned to lose their eyes, their hands or their feet. William rarely hanged men, preferring to give them time for repentance, while most of the lesser folk he released unpunished. Then, to ensure that Ely would not trouble him again, he ordered that a castle be built in the monastic precinct, where its mound still stands. Next, going to the abbey, he stood as far as possible from the tomb of the holy Ethelreda and threw a gold piece to her altar. He dared not go any closer, because he feared the judgment of God on the wrong he was doing to her shrine. And well he might, for though the monks kept their estates and their English abbot, King William soon found an excuse to levy an immense fine on them, so that they were forced to sell almost all the adornments of their church. When their payment proved a few coins short, he increased his demands still further, and they lost the few treasures that remained. But even after all this, mourns the Ellie book, no one believed that they would be left in peace, and nor were they. After further adventures, Hereward was eventually reconciled with William. However, another English leader, Earl Valtheoff, was not so fortunate. He had joined a conspiracy of Normans and Saxons, which was defeated in battle, and was executed at Winchester on May 31, 1076, just as he finished praying, and lead us not into temptation. And then goes the story in the hearing of all the head, in a clear voice, finished the prayer, but deliver us from evil. Amen. He was buried at Crowland, and according to Abbot Wolf Kettle of Crowland, many miracles took place at his tomb, including the rejoining of his head to his body. However, veneration of him as a saint was not permitted by the Norman authorities. Wolkatul was tried for idolatry before a council in London, defrocked and banished to Glastonbury. In 